1. I'd like to tell you a story about a dream my aunt once shared with me, and the maybe not so coincidental phone call that followed. My aunt and I have always been more receptive to the idea of an afterlife than others in my family. Her and I have frequently had dreams that later had some kind of relevance to a later event, and experiences that we couldn't quite explain. For me, these have lessened over time. But one day I was visiting my aunt and she told me about the dream she had the night before. She said one of the things she'll never forget about my great-grandfather, who passed about 15 years ago, was the old Model T he kept in his garage. Now her bedroom window faces the street, and in her dream she said she heard the Model T drive down the road and pull up in front of her house. She ran outside and saw my great-grandfather, her grandfather, parked out front, but there was a woman sitting in his passenger seat. He got out to say hello, but wouldn't tell my aunt who was in the car with him. She asked him why he was there, and he explained he was going on one more drive but didn't have a lot of time and just wanted to let her know he loves her. My aunt kept asking who else was in the car, pointing to the woman sitting in the passenger seat, but he refused to answer and drove off without saying a word, waving goodbye. My aunt said she woke up in the middle of the night crying, happy she saw her grandfather again, but upset because something seemed off. As she was telling me this story, the phone rang. She had this blank expression on her face which had me puzzled. After she hung up the phone, she told me the person who called was my grandmother to let her know her aunt, my great-grandfather's sister, had passed away last night in her sleep. The hairs on both our arms stood up as we both came to the same realization. The mystery woman in my great-grandfather's Model T that my aunt dreamed about the night before was his sister. He came back for one last drive to take his sister home and made a pit stop to let the rest of the family know. He's still thinking of them. I'm not sure what's waiting for us on the other side, but experiences like this give me some comfort that we might not have to face it alone. 2. I've believed in the paranormal for as long as I can remember. I didn't have any experiences until I was 8 to 10 years old and when I did, it was only footsteps. But being in a house with three other siblings and both parents, I couldn't really tell if the experiences were legitimate. After 14 years in our first home, we moved out due to my dad's new contract in 2003. We rented two homes during the two years it took my parents to find a decent-sized lot and build a new family home. There were unexplainable things that happened to us in both rentals. The first rental was a two-story, three-bedroom home with a decent-sized yard in a quiet neighborhood. The first floor, main level, was where my room was. It was big enough for two beds, so it was decided that my younger brother would sleep there as well. The second floor consisted of the master bedroom, bathroom and a smaller room, sister's room. My youngest brother still slept in my parents' bed with them. One weekend, I was lying in my parents' room watching TV. The only people that were home were myself, my mom, and my sister. While watching much music, I could hear my mom in the kitchen downstairs, and what I thought was my sister in her room, directly across the hall, flipping through her book. She's an avid reader. In between commercials, I would hear the pages of a book flipping, as though someone were searching for a page and then closing the book hard. I kept watching my show, but curiously listening, thinking my sister was just being weird. That's when I heard the sliding glass door downstairs open, and my sister's voice asking my mom for something. I jumped off the bed and looked into her room to find absolutely nothing out of place, and no one in there. I ran downstairs to tell my mom, and she kind of ignored me, until my sister left. When she finally acknowledged me, she told me that, when she's alone in the house, while we were all at school and my dad's at work, she heard a child's voice call out, Mom, from upstairs. She also heard knocking and footsteps when she was alone. I only ever heard noises in that home. The second rental 
was a one-story, two-bedroom rancher in another quiet neighborhood, but on a busier street. Because it was only a two-bedroom home, including the master, my brother and I shared a room that was what I can only imagine to be a separate formal dining room, because it was big enough to comfortably fit two queen beds in it. Our door was a curtain on a shower rod, so although it was private, sound travelled throughout the house. During the first month of living there, my bed shook twice in the middle of the night, strong enough to wake my brother and ask me why I was doing that. My younger sister would be afraid to be in her room alone, but she couldn't say why. We mostly ignored anything that happened in that house, because we knew our new home would be move-in ready shortly. After some time of ignoring whatever was there, things died down to footsteps and sounds at night. Now to what the title says. We moved into our new two-story, four-bedroom family home. My sister, being the only girl and keeping the trend going, got the biggest room. Her own personal bathroom and huge walk-in closet that took up one-third of the upstairs area. Both my brother's and my room were on the same floor. And much smaller, but my dad built it as a soundproof music room, above the garage, so we never complained. My parents' room was downstairs directly underneath my sister's room. Within the first two weeks in the new home, we noticed that my sister started sleeping with a light and stereo on at night. We asked her how she could sleep like that, and her response freaked me out a bit. She said she kept getting woken up by sounds coming from her closet, like books falling off her shelf, or in other cases like a pile of laundry being dropped on the floor. She also heard tapping on the door to her bathroom. I told her it was the sounds of a brand new house settling, but I didn't even buy what I was selling. But then we had grandparents who visited, stayed in that room and told us the exact same thing. After a while, my sister got used to it, because nothing more than strange sounds happened. Fast forward a year or so to a Saturday morning like any other. Both parents and both brothers had left in the early morning for a hockey practice, which left my sister and I alone in the house. We both got up around nine and I made breakfast for her. I dished her plate and started to head back upstairs to play video games. When I heard her scream and yell for me, I ran back down the stairs to find her sitting at the table, pale-faced and shaking. She told me that as soon as I turned the corner, she saw a little boy in old-fashioned clothes sitting to her left at the table, and when she turned to look at him, he vanished. The moment she finished telling me this, we both heard a small child laughing. The laughter wasn't coming from a specific spot, but was very clear. It was like the voice was everywhere in the house at once. We both heard the same thing. We agreed it didn't sound terrifying like in the movies. It was actually very happy sounding, like it was playing hide and go seek, and we found it. We both said aloud that we don't want to play anymore and left it at that. I don't think she saw him again. Not too long after that, my entire family was in the kitchen and dining area. I was cooking on the kitchen island, and I glanced up to see my mom coming out of her room. And as I looked back down at the pan, I saw a huge flash of light, like someone snapped a picture with a high-powered flash. My parents have a decent camera, so I asked my mom why she was taking pictures of us. She looked at me confused, and she said she didn't even have a camera. I asked what the flash was, and no one in the kitchen or dining area saw anything except for my youngest brother. He said, you saw it too. He told us he saw a flash of light move from one side of the kitchen to the other. I only noticed a blinding flash. There are more things I've experienced, but... Those were the best ones that came to mind. 3. Hey everyone. This story is shared between my mother and I. We believe we saw a ghost in Charleston, South Carolina. I was about 15 when this happened. I'm 17 now. We were looking through a gift shop pretty late at night, because we were going to go on a ghost tour of the city. I looked out the window of the shop to see someone dressed as a Confederate soldier. I quickly tapped my mom on her shoulder and told her. 
She turned around and said, Ah, cool. The person had on the full uniform from boots to a hat and was slightly marching. I found it very amusing. They kept looking around. I kept watching the person walk. No one was dressed like him and the people on the sidewalk he was walking on didn't even acknowledge him. I thought nothing of it at first, till we went on the ghost tour, where the tour guide told us about the strong ties the Confederate South had with Charleston. So at the end of the tour, I asked the tour guide if any people reenacted the war in that area of town, and she said no. My mom was wide-eyed, so the lady asked why I asked such a question. I told her and she said that it was likely I had spotted a spirit or ghost walking around. I honestly think I saw one too. If you ever have the chance to go there, there's a lot of places that claim there's ghosts there. It's a very old and historical town, so if you want to have a paranormal experience, that's a great place to stop by. Though that's my ghost story and I haven't experienced anything like that since. I don't know if this has any correlation, but a week later Dylan Roof shot up that one church, and the way the soldier was walking, he was walking straight towards it. For some reason I feel guilty, like maybe it was a sign or something. And I didn't know at the time. 4. This happened a couple of years ago, very soon after I moved into the home I currently live in. First, a little bit of background info. The house is a very old one, possibly the oldest I've ever lived in. The landlord, whose family has owned the land for hundreds of years, believes it was built in about the 1600s but I've often felt that it goes further back than that. It's a very old building nonetheless, and sits on a T-junction where one of the roads used to be the main way through to the nearest town, before it was blocked off and an alternative route was laid to Tarmac. That said, it's pretty quiet nowadays and sits upon a hill surrounded by crops, sheep and cows. It's a lovely, peaceful place. But we found out some of the history of it fairly recently. At one point it was a pub. Outside there is an old well covering, and there are old dilapidated pig sites and stables which look like they could have been built hundreds of years ago too. It used to be a stopping place along the way to the town, and many travellers spent time here. Anyway, on with the story. So we had just moved in about two days previously. We were surrounded by boxes, and I was in my room trying to organise my things. Now, this part is a bit hard to explain, so bear with me. One wall of my room, which separates it from the hallway, is made out of wood. There is a window in it, and also a small square has been cut away near the ceiling. There is also a long slit that runs the length of the wall from the square down to the floor, enabling me to see through it to some extent. This part overlooks the stairs. My bed is right beside this part of the wall, and was where I was sitting the day this incident occurred. I have no idea why the gaps are there. I'm guessing there was some purpose for this once upon a time, but who knows what it was now. So, with such thin walls and so many gaps in said walls, the sound travels pretty easily in this house. I can hear literally everything going on downstairs, and we can even converse with each other through the floorboards, without having to go upstairs or shout up them. On this day I heard my mum walk down the hallway, which runs the length of my room, and go down the stairs. She walked through the living room and into the kitchen through a door which is directly opposite the foot of the stairs. Shortly after she entered the kitchen, I heard what sounded like my own voice shouting, Oh, what? from the living room, directly underneath where I was sitting. Now this kind of thing happens to me fairly frequently. I hear a voice, often a voice, that sounds like someone I know, like my mum or another relative, speak or shout something out, but it's so brief that I ignore it and assume that it's just my mind playing tricks on me. But this time was different, because a few seconds later my mum was calling up the stairs. Did you just call for me? Hoping I'd been mistaken, I replied, no, wasn't that you? She said that no, it wasn't her, and asked if it was me once again. I said no, it wasn't. I hadn't said anything. I was too focused on what I was doing. We were both pretty spooked. My mum and I don't sound alike, really. 
aside from a few verbal mannerisms I've picked up. Her voices sound pretty different. I asked her what she'd heard, and she said she'd also heard someone shout. Oh, what? In exactly the same tone of voice I had heard. I was even more freaked out, and the hair on my neck was standing on end, especially since it had sounded so much like my own voice. And yet, there was no way it could have been me. We were both the only ones in the house at the time, and our TV wasn't even set up yet, so it wasn't that. Well, my family and I are not strangers to the paranormal, and for my mum and I especially, many things like this have happened. This is maybe because there is kind of a witch lineage thing going on in my family, and so we are both somewhat sensitive. I don't claim to be a psychic because I believe psychic ability is a quality that all people possess, but I certainly have some stories to tell. I know how to protect and defend myself, and I'm always careful in every ritual I perform. I also come from Essex, in southeast England, which has a very strong tradition of cunning folk, so literally everyone and their mum in my hometown either is a witch or knows of one. However, I now live in the southwest of England, where this event took place. Having said this, despite getting pretty well versed in the occult and a pagan, I have kind of a yes, but approach to most paranormal things, as I am quite strict about defining what is genuine and what is bullshit, hence why I often disregard the weird voices I occasionally hear. However, since this incident where my mom heard it too, I've begun researching similar experiences and began reading about mimics. The problem is that every source I've found has a different explanation for them. Interdimensional beings, elementals, demons, doppelgangers, etc. So I wondered if anyone on Reddit has had experiences with mimics or anything similar, and also whether or not they've come to understand anything more about them. 5. This was about 2006 or so, when I was a college freshman. Every weekend I would go home for a couple days, since I went to school about 20 minutes from my parents' house, and then come back on Sunday. Partly because I still wasn't quite ready to be entirely on my own, and partly because my roommate Patrick had women over to the dorm room with some regularity. So it worked out for both of us. I take off one Friday, and come back on Sunday afternoon to a visibly disturbed Patrick. I ask him what had happened, and he starts telling me this story from the previous two nights. Both Friday and Saturday night, right around midnight, Patrick had been woken up from his sleep by a chill running from the tip of his nose up to his forehead, and when he opened his eyes there was something hovering horizontally over him. He described it as a cloaked figure, but there was no figure actually wearing the cloak, just an empty space. However, there were a pair of eyes floating where eyes would normally be, but they were bloodshot, and the whites were yellow, and instead of round black pupils, it had white hourglass shapes. Patrick said that he spoke to him in French, and he flailed at it instinctively, and as soon as he did, it vanished. The same thing happened on Saturday night. Same time. Same chill up the bridge of the nose, same crazy eyes and invisible cloaked figure. When I asked what it had said to him, Patrick said it was speaking in an old dialect of French, basically the French equivalent of Shakespearean English, saying things like, It is your time. I've come for you. You'll never be rid of me. And so on. At the time this happened, I was completely straight edge, had never even smoked a joint, and only drank a bit of wine with family on holidays. So I was extremely sceptical, especially because Patrick was both a smoker and a drinker. So I started asking some questions, taking it all with a grain of salt. Patrick started telling me some backstory, which helped give me some context as to why he was so perturbed by what he thought he had seen. When he was a small child, maybe two to four years old, Patrick drowned in a lake in France where he was born and raised until his family moved to America. When his father pulled him out of the water, he gave him CPR while shouting in that same ye old French. 
You can't have him. It's not his time. And other such things. The dad was able to resuscitate Patrick, and they went on with their lives without further incident until now in college. Now this all seemed incredibly unlikely to me at the time, so I told him, in retrospect, this was a terrible idea. To speak to the thing he had seen, to tell it, in the old French, to appear before us. Patrick spoke a few words in a commanding tone, demanding that the apparition show itself. Within seconds, the temperature in the room plummeted. We're talking maybe 10 to 15 degrees in a matter of seconds, to the point where both Patrick and I were visibly shivering. I was fully clothed, and Patrick was just in his boxers, but it seemed to affect us equally. Just then, he starts screaming, Oh shit, it burns! And as I watch, a series of three long raised welts started appearing across his chest. I want to stress here that I watched this happen, and that he was in his boxers previously during the whole story session. He did not scratch himself, rub up on anything, or eat, drink, touch something that would have given him an allergic reaction. These welts seriously showed up out of nowhere, and they looked like someone had taken a very sharp knife and dragged the back end firmly across his skin. Two of the welts were horizontal, about ten inches long, one a few inches below the nipple, and the other about three to four inches below that. The third welt crossed over the two in a diagonal slash. I took pictures as they were raising, but unfortunately, I haven't been able to find those images in years. Since this happened, the computer they were on has broken. It's kind of hard to describe, but the welts were highly raised and slightly indented in the center. So Patrick is shouting that the welts on his chest burn and hurt. And between those and the temperature drop, I'm beginning to get concerned myself. Since I can't really determine what's going on. I had a passing interest for supernatural stuff at the time, and did absolutely every beginner protection type ritual that I could think of. I sprinkled salt at the thresholds of the doors and windows, lit a white candle and drew a protective rune on our whiteboard on the door. No idea if anything actually worked, but I was desperate and kind of freaked out. Unfortunately, nothing else happened that night. Although we stayed awake the entire time, to be sure. In the morning, the welts on Patrick's chest were gone. The next day, I go on to class as normal, and told one of my friends about what had happened. She was a Wiccan, or some other New Agey type thing, and was shocked at this story. She called a few of her friends, and that afternoon, they all met me at my dorm hall, even though I had never told them which one it was. My friend, and the two other ladies from her coven or whatever, came into my hall and started walking towards my room. I want to point out again that none of them had been to my room or even knew which number it was, but they all made a beeline directly for it. About 15 feet from the door, they all stopped in the hallway and said, It doesn't want us going any further. The leader of the group made protective charms for both Patrick and myself, using a small silver bell and a few other items. And that was pretty much the end of the issue. As far as I know, Patrick never takes his charm off and hasn't seen the thing again since. I've always tried to be skeptical about this story, since it's the closest I've come personally to something paranormal. But there are a number of things I can't actually explain, like the welts or the temperature drop. Hopefully some of you might have some insight for me, into what we experienced. But mostly I'm just glad to be able to tell this story. Hey everyone, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to 5 True Paranormal Stories, episode 34. Thank you very much to everyone who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Gotta admit, it felt kinda good to get this video done. Been a while since I've done a paranormal video, and I was kinda getting the itch to do one, so... And that's the first in a few weeks, so... Hopefully we're back on track, at least for a while. Uh, no guarantees in the TIFU for Saturday. I'm going to do my best, though, to get as many stories as I can. If not, I'll certainly have something up, don't worry. Okay, and with that, I think I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves. <laughs>